open your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 6. I'm going to look at verses 3 through 10. We're going to begin the new year talking about warnings and instructions. Um, Paul gives a lot of that here in this last chapter. Uh, and, you know, when we think about it, you'd, as he finishes up that chapter, it seems like, oh, it'd be nice if he really finished up with a whole lot of really nice things to say and all these good things that are happening. But he kind of he really points out some of the things that really need to be taken care of. We've been looking at some of this as we've gone through 1 Timothy, and, and we'll see how, obviously, this will apply to our lives today. 1 Timothy chapter 6, uh, verses 3 through 10. If anyone advocates a different doctrine and does not agree with sound words, those of our Lord Jesus Christ, and with the doctrine conforming to godliness, he is conceited and understands nothing. But he has a morbid interest in controversial questions and disputes about words, out of which arise envy, strife, abusive language, evil suspicions, and constant friction between men of depraved minds and deprived of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. But godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. For we have brought nothing into the world, so we cannot take anything out of it either. If we have food and covering with these, we shall be content. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare, and many foolish and harmful desires, which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil, and some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. So... Paul, as I mentioned, finishes up this letter here in chapter 6 with uh, these warnings and these um, instructions to the church. You know, and actually we do need warnings and instructions in life. I mean, that's just part of life, isn't it? That if there's um, something that's dangerous, uh, a, a bad place we shouldn't be, we need warnings about that. We see that, you know, even uh, like driving or traveling, we'll see warnings um, we see that in our relationships with people. Um, um, so there's, there's this understanding that, you know, warnings are very beneficial. But we also need, um, we need instruction in life, not just warnings, but we need to be taught about, you know, what God expects from us and what he wants from us and instructions about um, godliness. So let's begin today, um, first of all, by looking at what Paul warns. He gives some warnings at the very beginning of this, and we're going to take a look at these warnings to, um, in our lives today. Um, so we're going to see here in this section that we just read of, Ephes of um, 1 Timothy chapter 6, and actually throughout the whole chapter, we're going to look at some other verses as well from this chapter. We're going to see some very specific warnings that Paul gives to Timothy to give to the church in Ephesus because Timothy is there leading that church. And we, and we'll see that what warnings were given to the church um, in the first century are warnings that are applicable for the church um, today. Uh, so his first warning to the church is your witness. So he gives a warning about your witness um, in this world around you. And I say it's a warning about witness instead of instruction about witness because, you know, we're instructed in places and of scripture of, of this is what your witness should be and here's how to make your witness better and, and we get those instructions, but here we're gonna find a warning about the importance of our witness. And that warning is actually found in the first two verses. We, uh, we started in verse three, so you can look in your Bible um, in chapter six and you can see what Paul says in these first two verses. He's actually dealing with a situation that we don't even like to talk about um, today because he's, uh, he's talking to the slaves. So he gives um, some very specific warnings to slaves here in these first um, two verses. There are other places um, that Paul and, and Peter give instructions to slaves and masters on how they're supposed to act. And, you know, one of the things I was reading about all of this is that you know, that, that, you know, we don't see Jesus saying anything against slavery. We don't see Paul or the early apostles saying anything against slavery. But it seems like what they were trying to do by teaching the truth about our relationship with each other, that that would eventually put, you know, bring an end to slavery. Um, and so it, instead of standing up speaking against it, speaking the truth about relationships in our lives and how we should respond, that can bring about those, um, 
those types of changes. We're, you, we're more used to people, when they disagree with something, they're going to argue against it and, and speak against it instead of just speaking what the truth is and let the heart change. But he's talking about um, slavery here. He's talking to slaves who are Christians. They have, through the, the witness of the church, they've put their faith in Christ. doesn't change their position in life. They're still slaves. And so through that, Paul gives them you know, this instruction about um, about being a good slave to their master and treating their masters with respect. But then the warning that he gives is something that's very interesting. He says, because some of you slaves are gonna, will have Christian masters instead of just a worldly master. He says, show respect to, you know, to your worldly master. But he says, some of you are going to have Christian mas masters in the same church together, brothers in Christ. And yet, we have this situation, this social situation that's different. And he says, uh, for, for you slaves who have Christian masters, don't use that as an excuse to slack off and to treat them with less respect because they're your brothers, thinking, well, they're my brother and they're not going to mistreat me. They're not going to come against me because we're brothers in Christ. Don't use that for your advantage. And it's, it's interesting to think about how, how people would use their own Christianity and somebody else's Christianity um, as an advantage in that, in that interaction. But I think people do that today because they will say, oh, well, you're a Christian. You need to do this. You're a Christian. This is my view of what a Christian should do, and you have to do that. And instead of treating each other with the respect that we should treat each other. And so the witness, he says is the warning about the witnesses, you are a witness to others. How do you treat your master? How do you treat your master that's a believer? He says, show respect and, is, and show extra respect to those, to those masters, to your master um, if he is a brother. And this is a warning for us today because our witness is very important. And the warning is don't let your circumstances mess up your witness. Don't let the situation that you're in all of a sudden um, cause you to not be such a good witness for the Lord and then using the situation, using the circumstances as an excuse not to be a good witness um, for, uh, for the Lord and our relationship with him. So we are, uh, we are called to show re, uh, respect to others. How do we respond to each other? How do we respond to people in authority? How do we respond to brothers and sisters in Christ? Uh, we need to look at all of that and make sure that we don't let circumstances around us, our circumstances, cause us to try to take advantage of somebody else. And so, um, again, showing more respect to those who, it should be natural to show more respect to those who are dear to us as a brother or sister in Christ. So that's the first warning that he gives right off the bat as he begins this cha chapter. The next warning focuses on your teaching because we teach things and we're, and we're, and we're sharing messages and, and we have to be careful because you know, what we learn and hear somewhere else, we, we tell to people around us, <clears throat> not necessarily teach in a class or anything like that, although you, you might be a, a teacher of a class, but, you know, you hear, you hear a doctrine, you hear an idea, and you start sharing that idea of, you know, that this is what you do, this is what you believe. And when you do that, you are, you are actually teaching somebody. Paul is talking about these false teachers that were in the church and the negative influence that they had on the church. And Paul's focus has been on teaching godliness. And we're going to look at that some more. Um, but these, <clears throat> these false teachers... Um, he said, don't agree with the instructions from Jesus and godly teaching, this teaching on godliness. And instead, they're getting caught up in other things, these false teachers. We don't know a whole lot about what they were doing, but they were causing trouble along the way. <clears throat> our, our teaching, our focus as the church should be a focus on teaching godliness. What does it mean to follow God? What does that look like in our life? What does God want from us? How, what are the changes that, that God wants to make um, in our lives so that we can live this witness that, that we're supposed to live? But this false teaching, he says, leads to controversies and quarrels and frictions within the body of Christ. And, you know, I think about that because it's very, in, it's very 
easy to fall into this trap of thinking, well, this is an interesting teaching, so you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really focus on that, but really, maybe all it's going to do is cause some quarrels, um, and, and maybe it's going to cause some strife within the church, and we need to be careful of that because of the focus of our teaching should be on godliness and how, we're to, how we are to respond as God wants us to respond. He says this, the, this teaching, a, a warning against this teaching is that the result is envy and strife. And so that he says it's, it's wrong to teach these things. It's wrong to go down these paths that are disrupting and dividing the church instead of preaching uh, for the unity of the body of Christ through godliness as we, as we follow God. So he gives a warning against false teaching. He also gives a warning Again, concerning your motives, because your motives about doing things are very important, <clears throat> and nobody else knows your motives. We can even deceive ourselves about our motives, but God knows our motives, and so it's, it's very important that we, we examine the motives for, what, for why we do the things that we do and make sure that those motives are godly. And Paul warns um, against this, um, this idea of doing things with the wrong motives. Again, he's specifically <clears throat> pointing out that this group, whoever's doing this false teaching, <clears throat> has a warped view of this idea of godliness and financial rewards. Um, he, he even points out that this group, whatever, whoever this was, that they were teaching that godliness is a means to financial gain. Now think about that because we hear that type of teaching today, that if you are godly, if you'll follow God, then he's going to bless you with financial gain. Um, that's a message that's, that's in our world today um, from radio and TV and, and churches, that this idea. And so Paul points out here that this is a false teaching that was going on in Ephesus, and he warns Timothy to help you know, help these people who are teaching this to examine their motives of what they're doing. And he's pointing out their negative motives. Um, so think about your motives as you follow God. Think about, you know, the, the reason that you, that you obey God, the reason you come to church, the reason that you read the Bible and pray and, and, and follow him and, and hopefully allow him to change your life. Do you follow God because he's given you life? And, and he's leading you um, to uh, what it means to, to live that life that pleases him? Or are you following God to gain something in your life, to gain something for yourself, a selfish desire? Paul warns about motives. And again, we're going to see here in this, in this chapter, he's going to spend a little bit of time talking about um, those motives. And then what he really spends the mo amount of time on is the warning about your riches. Um, and this is something that, that um, there's nothing new under the sun. The things that people struggle with way back then are the same things that we struggle with today, keeping things in balance. And part of the out-of-balance situation that was happening at, at that church, and at least with that group of false teachers and those who were going along with that, was this misunderstanding about riches. And so he gives warnings about riches. He says, people who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. There, there's a biblical warning about pursuing riches, and we need to pay very close attention to this because we get caught up in the American dream, we get caught up in what our culture says, and the whole idea that we're, we're bombarded with is this pursuit of riches and Paul makes it very clear that that pursuing riches will lead to ruin and destruction. And it's not about the riches themselves. It's about the pursuit. What are we pursuing in our lives? And we're going to talk about that a little bit more in a moment. But we have to remember uh, that we have this temptation and what he has, what has been temp uh, temptation within that church, I believe a temptation today, is to think somehow that godliness is a means to financial gain. Again, and verse 10 is very familiar with us here as he's talking about riches. 
Uh, for the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. And some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Uh, not money is the root of all evil, but the love of money is the root of all evil. Money is just a thing. Riches, that's just a thing. Okay? But it's what we pursue. It's what we're going to love. Uh, when, they, when they ask Jesus, you know, what's the great commandment? It was about love. Not loving money or loving things, but about loving God. Second like it, about loving people. So when we, get, <clears throat> when we get our love all mixed up and we get our pursuits all mixed up, then we're going to have a problem because that will, that will pierce our life with many griefs. So the warning is pursuing money as your primary pursuit. It's against um, loving money and riches instead of loving God. And again, as I said, there's nothing new under the sun. What they struggled with, uh, what they were tempted with, we are tempted with that um, today. But we are warned. So these are some of the warnings here in 1 Timothy chapter 6 as Paul gives these warnings to the church. And just as they were warnings that applied to the church in the first century in Ephesus, these are warnings that apply to our church today here in Harlingen. So let's look now at the instruction. Because Paul doesn't just warn but he instructs as well. And we need to do this in our lives. We, you know, we warn, but we need to make sure that we instruct so that a person can understand how to get, you know, to get beyond that warning and know what to do. Um, <clears throat> things, you know, there are things in life that we need to avoid. Um, things will bring about destruction in our life, the problems in our life. And so we can be warned against it, but the instruction, it shows us how to detour, detour around those things. Paul's, fir Paul's first instruction is about contentment. He instructs them with, about godliness with contentment. Um, godliness in our lives is the desire to live a life following God. That's what godliness is for us. <clears throat> Again, the false teachers taught that following God, you know, as you follow God, you know, that's going to lead to riches. But the message is godliness with contentment, having this, this, this desire to follow God and to be content. And Paul talks about this. I mean, he talks about it in other places, about this contentment that he has. He can be in a great situation where he's taken care of. He can be in a bad situation where he's suffering. And he says, either one of those places, <clears throat> I can be content. And he showed that. In, in fact, um, in, in Philippi, he showed that he was in... When Lydia was taking care of Paul and those who were traveling with him, he was living the great life, <clears throat> the easy life. He was still preaching, but he had a nice place to stay, good food and all that sort of thing. But then, because of his preaching, he was thrown into, the, into jail. And in jail, um, he was put in the stocks at the bottom, of, in the basement of the, of the dungeon. And yet, we see the contentment there as well, because Paul and Silas were praising the Lord even in that situation. So he learned contentment in his whole life, no matter if it was good or bad. And so he, the teaching for us is godliness with contentment. And then, you know, this idea of contentment, he says, think about it. You're not going to take any of this stuff out of this world. It's all going to be left behind. Um, no U-Hauls behind a hearse, right? I mean, it's all going to be left behind. Um, we're, we're not taking it with us. In fact, um, Paul teaches in Corinthians that when we stand before Jesus, we're not judged for our salvation because that is, that's already taken care of through Christ. But, but he wants to look at what we did in our lives. And we talk about that judgment of Christ, the judgment seat of Christ, where he's going to look at what we did. And, and if the things are eternal, then uh, he says that's gold and silver and precious um, stones. But if things are temporary and riches is going to fall in that temporary then it's wood, hay, and stubble. It's going to burn up. And, and he says, whatever you do, whatever you pursue in this life, you're going to have, uh, you're going to build it as part of your life, and you're going to present it before God, before Jesus, at the end of your life, and he's going to say, this is what really mattered, and this didn't matter at all. Now, our riches can be used for eternal things. I mean, you see plenty of examples of that, of, of, of people in their lives. You've experienced it in your life that our riches can be used for 
for eternal things, but the, the riches themselves, that should not be our goal. That's, there's nothing eternal <clears throat> about your bank account. It's what we do with that. And so, it's, again, it's a matter of the pursuit in our lives. And Paul says, pursue godliness with contentment because that will help balance out things um, in, in the desires and this idea of being satisfied in our lives so that we can continue to grow. And as we follow God and we allow God to work in our lives and understand this godliness, that will bring about a great contentment. I mean, just think about the peace in your life, that peace that passes understanding that you have through contentment in Christ, and that is the great gain that he talks about because we get so worried, so worked up about so many things, and we might have the riches that we've been pursuing, but we may have lost the peace and contentment along the way. But that peace and that contentment that we have in Christ, pursuing godliness, that's the great gain that he talks about. And again, <clears throat> this is hard because we have these desires and these goals in our own, our own life. And so the question is, is God your desire? I mean, that's where it starts. Is God your desire? And then everything else is a desire that builds off of that. Is godliness with contentment your desire? And then whatever happens financially for you in your life, it will be built on that foundation in your life. But if you're setting aside your desire for God, if you're setting aside your, des your desire for godliness with contentment and just pursue the riches, then, then that, will, that will be a thorn in your relationship with Christ. That will, that will damage um, your, your life in Christ and your relationship with God and, and maybe things that happen in your life because uh, those are the warnings that Paul gives. And we see we, we lose the foundation. The foundation is cracked and crumbling and, and the, the riches may come, but the contentment with godliness won't. And, you know, we've read, I mean, you've read plenty of articles about plenty of people who have made it to where they wanted to make it, and they get there, and they're not any happier than they were before. And so as we look at that contentment, that is so important for us. So how do we overcome these temptations in life? Well, we we'll listen to Paul's next instruction, pursue the things of God. Remember, it's all about pursuing. Are you pursuing God and the things of God? Or are you pursuing this world and our culture and riches and all that? In verse 11 and 12, he says, But flee from these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called, and you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. So flee from this worldly call to pursue riches, but instead, pursue the things of God. Righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, gentleness. As we pursue this, then all these other things are taken care of. I'm not saying that's going to lead to financial gain, because that's what the false teachers were saying, but it's going to lead to that godliness with contentment. So as you live your life with your family and your career and your pursuits, put this pursuit first, pursuing God. Righteousness, godliness, faith, love, and perseverance. That's going to keep everything in context. And it's a battle. It's a battle, and that's why Paul tells Timothy to fight the good fight. Battle through the temptations of this world um, that's around us and, <clears throat> and live out your faith every day. And it's really not that complicated. It's not easy, but it's just not that complicated. Paul makes it clear that we should, what we should do. And then he teaches Timothy one more thing to teach to the church. Stay faithful till the end. Stay faithful till the end. Verse 14 and 15. That you keep the commandment without stain or reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will bring about at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Keep these commandments until Jesus comes back. And by the way, we don't have to worry about when Jesus is going to come back. He's going to come back at the proper time, whether you figure it out or not. But stay faithful to the very end. We find in here that 
Paul warns and Paul instructs. We need to take heed to these warnings and we need to follow these instructions. It's for your own good, right? It's for our own good that this message is given to us. And if you, as a, you as a parent, probably remember saying this to your child sometime, it's for your own good, whether they believe you or not. Uh, but, it, but you know, and that's what God is telling us through Paul as he writes this letter. It's for your own good. Um, the truth of God will pull away this veil of deception that comes from this world, and we can see what's truly important. There's a movie many years ago, The Matrix, right? Some of you may have seen that. Um, weird movie, um, but the message was very interesting. Neo, Mr. Anderson, uh, was living this life that he thought he was living, and then he met Morpheus, swallowed a pill, I can't remember which color it was, and then he saw life as it truly was. In our lives, we don't have to meet a Morpheus, but we come to Christ. We don't have to swallow a pill, but we put our faith in Christ. And then all of a sudden, the veil of deception is taken away that comes from this world, comes from the devil, and we can see what the truth really is. And when you see the truth as, God's, as God reveals that to us through his word, and then that, that deception's taken away, then we can clearly understand these warnings, and we can clearly follow these instructions. So, new year. Let's think about warnings and instructions for our lives so that we live this life of godliness with contentment, pursuing God and the things of God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for um, this time together. Thank you for uh, the word that you've given to us and these warnings, instructions that come from Paul. I pray, Father, that we would um, pay very close attention to them, examine our hearts to find out what, we're, what brings temptation in our life um, so that we would be able to pursue you and to overcome these temptations. In Jesus' name I pray.